Hello. In this clip from our Justia webinar, attorney licensure and the impaired professional, Lori Besden and Tracy Kepler will talk about their personal story regarding mental health problems and will present relevant data about mental health issues in the legal industry. Remember, if you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, we're thrilled that you can join us today for this presentation on attorney licensure and the impaired professional. Um, just so you can, uh, if, you, if you have questions, as Nina said, please put them in the Q&A. But if there are things that we do not get to or um, you feel more comfortable reaching out to us offline, please feel free to do that as well. Our phone numbers, as well as our email addresses, are on the slide in front of you. Um, just to give you a little bit of overview of where we're headed in the next hour, um, Lori and I are going to share a whole bunch of information that we hope will be incredibly helpful to you when you're thinking about the health and well-being of the legal profession, as well as when you are seeing a colleague and there's a concern and that you want to reach out and that you want to help that individual, not only the individual, but yourself. So we're going to go through um, um, a share of Lori, share her experience um, with these issues on the road to redemption. We're also going to set the stage with some data that we've seen about the legal profession and its well-being or sort of lack thereof at this point. In addition, we're going to look at some of the model rules of professional conduct that speak to these issues of well-being. And lastly, we're going to round out this presentation by talking about how you can reach out to a colleague where, where you're concerned that there's an issue, how you can put some best practices into your firm setting, and how you can put some best practices into your own personal life to improve your own health and well-being, some boundaries, setting some expectations, um, and give you some practical takeaways as we move in um, to this not only busy holiday season, but for all throughout the week, all throughout the year. So Lori, I will turn it over to you to get us started with your story of the road to redemption. Thank you so much, Tracy. As Tracy mentioned, absolute honor and privilege to be here with you, whether it's this morning, this afternoon, on demand, um, and to share this information with you. I had so many thoughts as Tracy was speaking. Um, I, I understand it could be the end of a compliance period. Sometimes people sign up because they're like, I need an ethics credit. Um, sometimes we put programs on webinars and they're on in the background. I always feel the need to share the statistic. Only 2.6% of us can successfully multitask, meaning you put something on in the background, you're working on a brief. And I'm not saying that we should have your priority and attention, um, but I am just saying, I, I think that's a statistic worth pointing out. I say it every single program that I present. And if you were also wondering how we are going to present all that information, in 53 minutes, I'm wondering the exact same thing. No, I'm just kidding. So um, part of this program is an awareness. Every single person on this program today, every single person that will watch this on demand either knows somebody that has struggled with substance use or mental health, knows somebody in recovery from either substance use, mental health, or knows somebody that has passed away regarding from substance use or mental health disorder. Every single one of us. For some of us, it's us. Um, and when we talk about the data and the statistics in our profession, at the end of the day, we're gonna talk about specific, specific studies. At the end of the day, it is one in three. So when I sat in law school and I sat there all confident, you know, in orientation and I heard a statistic close to that, I was sitting there pointing fingers to the people next to me. And here I am about to share a story that I almost died on drugs that started, my addiction started in law school. And I was the last person on the planet that thought this could happen to them. So I share this story because if this can happen to me, it can happen to any one of you. It can and has happened to family members of yours. 
But there's also, as long as somebody is breathing, there is hope. And I sincerely mean that. I don't share any of this because I'm proud or look at me and obviously you'll hear the story of relax. That wouldn't be the reason somebody shares this, but we share it because it's practical and that just because somebody has been arrested or has struggled with an addiction doesn't mean they don't have a future and doesn't mean they can't, you know, go after their dreams and achieve them and then some. As I'm speaking, Tracy is going to leaf through with a PowerPoint to show some pictures just of my life that went on in my life, um, because it's one thing to hear a story about addiction. It's another thing to see the actual pictures. Um, so I grew up outside of Philadelphia in what I often term a two-story home. Many of us can relate to that. One story on the inside, one story on the outside. And before we were even born, our, and I, I grew up with one sister, three and a half years older, my parents knew we were going to be a lawyer and a doctor. So that was the family, like, other people can relate to that. Uh, they knew what we were going to do. That was the path. They were going to hand us everything to make that happen, but that's what it was going to be. So going through my sister, her, her childhood uneventful. I barely even remember that I had a sibling in the house because I was causing mass destruction from the moment I could even make decisions. So I was just, you know, whether it was lighting matches and keeping a stack of matches under my bed that were burned out, just I just was always that kid who just got in trouble. So age eight, first taste of anything outside of myself, I was given nitrous for routine dental cleaning. I have no idea why an eight-year-old would be given uh, nitrous, but it happened. And that literally set off a match inside me that I knew I'd like to escape what my natural feelings were because the moment I had something in my body, I felt, and I'm not saying most people don't feel this from nitrous, but I just felt whole. I don't know any other way to say people in recovery, when we look back, we just say like there was a hole in my soul. And I didn't know it until I started filling it with substances, alcohol, people, relationships, food, whatever it was, just the disease of more. So age 12, first time I had any alcohol, best friend slept over. We had an older friend drop off two six packs. We got drunk. We were walking around my neighborhood in Plymouth Township. I, I, one of us didn't even have pants on. I mean, we were wasted. Twelve years old, walking around. It's two o'clock in the morning. Police came, drove up to us. We were holding the beer that we hadn't drank yet, and ended up at the police station. Of course, they call. You know, talk to my mom. Wake her up in the middle of the night. It was actually Mother's Day, two o'clock in the morning on Mother's Day. And my mom said, not Laurie, she's in bed sleeping. No, no, Laurie was at the police station. All four parents come and I literally in the hallway, and I still remember this moment, said to my parents, this was really Shelby's idea. She's really a bad influence. Okay, Shelby currently is still a very good friend of my life. She's a pharmacist. She is not the one presenting a program on substance use because she does not have a substance use issue. The issue was not Shelby. So... Time goes on and, you know, I did what my friends did. I smoked pot, I drank, but everything in my life was to excess, everything. So even when I knew I was going to go drinking with my friends in high school, I would drink a few beers beforehand just to level the playing field. I just never felt comfortable in my own skin. It was almost like I was walking around in somebody else's body. And so, you know, college, my sister went to Penn State. Um, by the time it was time for me to go to college, I decided I would go to University of Maryland because I always felt like I was compared to her, but that is definitely a story that I made up. And so, you know, I went and even as a kid, my dream to like the poster board, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? What do you want to do? And mine was always be a cosmetologist and don't judge me based on my hair. It's not a great background for hair. But I always wanted to be a cosmetologist, always. I still cut my own hair. And so I did want to go to college. I went to University of Maryland, as I mentioned. I was a criminology and criminal justice major. And my family, and I'm just stating facts, made our education very easy for us. They handed it to us. So all my family cared about, they cared about my grades. That was the only conversation we had throughout my entire education. How are your grades? How's school? How's everything? School, are you studying enough? So I graduated in three and a half years with a 3.97, which sounds fabulous. This is great. Except my behavior in college, I was living in a suite my last two years with six girls. 
One is still one of those people, still my best friend today. And her and I, we would get a case of beer on Thursday nights and we would literally start drinking when we were in the shower. And my thought was, this is like time management. By the time you go out, you're wasted. You don't even have to buy alcohol. Majority of the nights, we never even made it out the door. Um, and But in my defense, I wasn't the only one doing it. She was doing it too. So I thought, I wasn't even thinking, could there be a problem? I just assumed because I was doing it and someone else that it was normal. And it's college. Okay, but unfortunately for me, the party never ended. It ended in prison. But for Kathleen, she doesn't drink in the shower now, and she didn't need to go to prison to stop that behavior. Kathleen now actually works for Homeland Security. So very much like Shelby, these were, you know, times in people's lives, and then they matured. And that never happened with me, because once I set off that switch, I could never turn it back. So here I was so drunk on those still Friday mornings from drinking Thursday night into Friday. I had an internship with Chrome Probation in Silver Spring, Maryland. I would line the corner stall to nap off a hangover while people were giving literally urine samples in the stalls next to me. And the irony, the irony is that I actually later ended up on Chrome Probation. Um, but just this entire story is so extreme because this is actually how it was. But my grades are great. So, and I honestly never knew anybody who was in recovery or needed to be in recovery. My family didn't drink or drug. So I assumed this would never happen to me. So it's now time. I graduate early and my, my sister was in medical school, which is fabulous considering botany was my greatest science. It was not happening for me. And we had a family meeting, you know, Laurie, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I said, I want to go to cosmetology school. And they were like, that is, that is great. How about after law school? It wasn't really a question. It was a statement. So I went to Dickinson School of Law and I don't mean to sound ungrateful. I had a great experience. I am so grateful for my education. I could not do what I do today without it. But here I went in and people are like, I want to be a trial attorney. And I was literally like walking around with scissors. I'm like, does anybody need a haircut? I was just lost, lost. And I heard the presentation from my predecessor saying, you know, substance use, mental health, one in three of you will struggle. And I thought, who is this guy talking to? We're in law school. Does he not know who we are? And he told this story that he ended up on LSD and now works for this organization. And I actually felt bad for him which is kind of funny because I now have his job. <laughs> and so I go through law school and honestly, I was afraid to fail. I was afraid to fail my family. All they cared about were my grades. So I was afraid to not give 5,000%. I studied my butt off. I rewrote the outlines. I was in every study group. I, I can't even tell you how much I did because I was so afraid if I didn't do well enough that for, I would have, I'd be going to school forever. So inevitably, I was top 15% of my law school class. And um, third year of law school, and I maintained that throughout. Third year of law school, I was in a car accident. I was the passenger. We were both drunk, coming back from a Pearl Jam concert, went into the guardrail, and we both ended up in the emergency room. I was given, I, I don't know, it was 20 to 30 biking in at the time for a very minor leg injury. That little prescription of biking in, we all know somebody that had this story. We all know somebody literally lit a match that caused a forest fire that almost killed me. I went a thousand miles an hour straight into a drug addiction that I didn't think I could catch. My hands are in air quotes there. Um, and I just thought, well, okay, these pills improve my ability to focus. I'm going to start going to the emergency rooms in the area, in the Carlisle, Pennsylvania area with my law books. Look at me. I'm a big law student. I could never have a problem. And I ended up doing that until I found a doctor on the internet that would send a hundred of these Vicodin overnight working with a pharmacy in San Antonio, Texas with refills. And so I went from having to spend hours in the ER to then just making a phone call. By the time I took Pennsylvania and New Jersey bar exams, I was taking, I had three to four identities going with the same doctor in Texas. And I was literally calling him, starting to impersonate a male. It didn't even matter. But these scripts were coming. I was taking three 10 milligram pain pills an hour to get through these exams. I passed Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I, 
I'm not proud. I share that because I needed these pills like you need oxygen. You get up, you blink, you don't think about it. I had to have these drugs or I could not get out of bed. I did not realize that for five years. Five years, I was in denial. So inevitably, I passed the bar exam. I go away on a trip with the person I was seeing, Spain and Africa. I called in a refill from Spain. I fly home early. I had a clerkship that started. I clerked on the Pennsylvania Superior Court for a former Pennsylvania Supreme Court justice, drafting appellate opinions right into chambers with me when my addiction. But I started in August. By December, I had nine identities going with the same doctor. All these drugs coming to chambers. Signature required 40 pain pills a day to function. I call one day the doctor suspended. Doctor suspended. And I still thought it was recreational. And that's why sometimes when you talk to people that are struggling, you think, right, there's no way they can believe what they're saying. I believed what I was saying. I just thought there had to be a way to stay one ahead of the system. So I started calling in my own prescription. No, I'm not a doctor. No, I never went to medical school. No, I don't have my own DEA number. Figured it all out. Started calling in my own scripts. I don't know. And this is while I was a law clerk licensed in two states to practice law. I was calling in prescriptions from the Superior Court courted vote. I'm not proud of it. It's just what the situation was. I don't know that I miss many pharmacies between Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and Atlantic City, New Jersey, about 180 mile radius. I added Ambien, I added Xanax to the mix. And obviously, my tolerance skyrocketed because my access skyrocketed. I was calling in scripts of 100 with four refills. Today, that, I mean, that would get flagged in a heartbeat, but 25 years ago, it didn't. And so inevitably, that clerkship was one year after it, that was on to the next thing. And I must have lined up another clerkship while I was still in law school, because I can't imagine in my addiction that I would have had the energy. I don't have a memory of how, how this came to be, but I'm sure I lined it up in law school. Another clerkship on the municipal court in Philadelphia for three judges, where the accountability was pretty low. I, they would give me work, I would take it home, I would work on it, and I would bring it back to chambers. So it was not a peer in court five days a week job. That made things even worse as far as my addiction went because I, I knew I didn't need to be in the office or show up necessarily. It got so bad that I was actually writing faxes to the judges in crayons and faxing them in a fax machine at like two o'clock in the morning that my dog had an emergency and I couldn't be there. I mean, I was asked to show up one to two days a week and I couldn't even do it. Also during this second clerkship, a friend of mine, we got together, they put out a cocaine, Again, I already mentioned I'm not from a family where I've ever seen either of my parents drink or drugs still to this day. And I looked at the cocaine. Me mom calling in drugs left and right across two states. That's no problem, of course. And, and I thought, well, that's a serious drug. I did the cocaine. I did not stop taking that drug until my freedom was taken from me. I went to, I started about 150 pounds within I'd, less than less than six weeks. I was literally down to, and you can see like 110 pounds, it came off rapidly so much so that my mom contacted the one judge I was clerking for and said, Laurie's going to need some time off. She has an issue to address. I assumed I'm obviously going to rehab. My nose is bleeding. I'm awake for days in a row. My mom had to have figured this out. And so she gave me an address. It was before Waze and MapQuest. It was MapQuest. You just literally printed out the directions, but you didn't know where you were going. There was no Google. And so I show up and I hadn't been, I was awake for four days. I'm a cocaine bender. So I brought Belgian donuts, knowing I'd be doing an intake and come down and I'd be able to eat. The bottom line is my mom diagnosed me and thought I had an eating disorder. Never once, and she will admit this, we presented many times together, ever even considered that I could have possibly had a drug problem. Never even considered. She assumed I had an eating disorder problem, brought me to an eating disorder facility where after hours of observation, including having me eat the food I brought and not asked to be excused, they refused to admit me. And my mom thought I was gaming the system. Bottom line, she went left, I went right. In that left and right, four years passed. Ultimately, between 2002 and 2004, I was arrested five times, one time for DUI, four for felony prescription fraud in two states, 
um, 29 car accidents, three incarcerations, three rehabilitations. And every time I got arrested without fail, I'm like, but I'm an attorney. No, you're a defendant, you're a criminal, you're a felon is really. And I just remember me going like as if that would be the ego get out of jail card. And January 29th, 2004 is my sobriety date. And on that day, it was a volunteer from the exact organization that I worked for that called my house, called the police station as I was typing my own statement. Don't ask. I know it's not very legal advice. Um, in my case, it worked out, but that's definitely not something to do. And then came to the prison to visit me that day, um, almost 20 years ago, and brought me a message of hope and recovery. And he said, I'm in recovery. I'm 31 years sober. There are thousands of us. And I'm like, what? I, I thought I had, I thought I was unique. I don't have uniqueers on. I thought I was the only person in the world in this profession that's got a drug problem. And he said, there are, there are meetings. There's a, this organization, Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers. And I'm like, oh my God, I remember that guy in law school, the one I felt bad for. Yeah, as I'm in prison, I'm remembering my predecessor. And so Dave kept showing up. And I didn't understand why he told me to start going to AA meetings, NA meetings, do whatever I had to do to start working on myself. I had no intention. I didn't even think I could stay sober. And so I spent 11 and a half months incarcerated. Um, January, like I said, January 29, 2004 is my sobriety date. When I, I went into prison, I was 110 pounds at the weigh-in and I'm 5'9", so that's definitely a problem. When I left prison, um, I, at this picture here, I was 253 pounds 11 and a half months later. Food simply became my next drug in prison. Um, at this point afterwards, I got very involved with LCL after I was released. I was obviously on parole um, and I reported everything to the Pennsylvania Disciplinary Board and I was suspended three years. Um, I entered a, a voluntary uh, joint petition for suspension in Pennsylvania for three years, then in New Jersey for three years. I mean, how I wasn't disbarred, I can't even tell you. And I worked in a law firm, Dave, let me get the job. I got very involved in recovery meetings. I started bringing recovery meetings to the prison where I was an inmate. 2008, I filed for reinstatement because Dave told me to. I never, how could a convicted felon get reinstated? I couldn't even go to cosmetology school and get a state issued license, but he thinks I can get my license to practice law back. So ultimately I filed for reinstatement by a miracle much greater than myself. Um, I was reinstated to the practice of law in Pennsylvania in 2009, and then in New Jersey in 2010. And then in 2011, I came on board with this organization that saved my life because I'm the product we sell. Hey, look at my great family. Da, 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 da. And I almost died. If I did not get stopped, if the system did not stop me, I would be de dead 20 years ago. Um, and so I work with amazing people like Tracy, and we share this story to let people know that there is so much hope out there, as long as somebody is breathing, that there is hope. So since I've been with LCL, I filed for a governor's pardon that was supported by the Chief Justice on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court at the time by letter, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> as well as the judge that sent me to prison every single one of those times, including the last time for a year, stood at the podium at the pardon hearing asking the governor to pardon me. Ultimately, that's me holding my pardon. I was pardoned in 2020. And the reason that I asked for a pardon was because there were things I wanted to do. I regretted never serving the country. And I said I would consider, you know, maybe being a volunteer firefighter. I'm now six months into that process. Um, and I needed a clear record to be able to do it. In this other picture, you can see there, um, I, me and my sister, we were both artificial insemination. 2017, I sent my DNA to 23andMe, and I literally have now found 11 siblings and my biological father that is in that picture, um, and a couple of the siblings I found are in that picture. And I say to people all the time, get sober. At 13 years sober, you get a whole new family. Every time I see 23 and me, you have matches. I'm like, oh my God, new sibling alert. And what an amazing journey it's been. I was approved to donate a kidney in 2013. Um, I do a lot of work with animal rescue. I take my one dog, there's Maisie, to memory care. I bring her to the law schools. 
She's been to the state capitol. And I'm a very big, I volunteer to rescue every Saturday, all because folks like that work and volunteer with LAPS do the work that they do. There's Dave, there's also the district attorney that prosecuted me, that sent me to prison for a year. We've shared our story from American to Harvard. Um, it's been the New York Times. I've been to Peloton, which I'm a huge Peloton enthusiast. With several friends of mine that are judges. And again, I went from literally be knocking on death's door um, at 110 pounds to being given this gift of life because somebody else cared enough to pay it forward to me. So that is the way to set the stage for the program. I'm now going to turn it back over to Tracy to talk a little bit about more of the actual data and statistics. Thanks, Lori. It's, it's such a powerful story. It's so important because it really does show this incredible road. And one person's story is going to morph into, I, I hate going after you because it seems so anticlimactic, but we hear one person's story and then we share some of the data about the profession as a whole. And some of the data you may have heard already, um, you know, came out of a 2016 study done by the American Bar Association and Hazelden Betty Ford um, to um, treatment facilities um, looking at American lawyers. They looked at about 13,000 lawyers and they did a study on not only um, problematic alcohol usage, but also substance use, as well as some mental health issues. And some of the data that they found um, really was um, life changing for those of us in this community. Um, you know, we always thought it sort of turned us on our ears. We always thought that it was the more seasoned professional who suffered from these issues in, in to a greater extent. And what we found is it's completely not true. It is the younger professional, the per the lawyer who is out of law school for ten years or less, or who is under thirty that is really suffering at greater to to a greater extent. You can see some of the data of, you know, the entire population, licensed attorneys and judges, and then the statistics for those attorneys under 30 where we are suffering or where they're suffering on, with problematic alcohol usage. Also again, study on depression, anxiety, stress, Remembering that all this data was before COVID, so I think these numbers have only increased, and we'll see some some data about that later. You know, 28% of all attorneys responding that they are suffering from some sort of depression, stress, anxiety. And these results were similar in that we saw younger attorneys suffering from these issues at a greater percentage than their more seasoned counterparts. Every year um, for the past five or six or so, um, ALM and law.com has actually run a survey of about 3,800 attorneys. And I think this year's numbers um, were particularly important or surprising, but not in a good way, in that this year um, we're seeing increases right? 5% increases in the number of attorneys who said that they, they had some anxiety. Um, a 35% increase over the year before of attorneys dealing with depression. Um, you know, the number of lawyers who actually struggled with a me another mental health issue more than doubled in one year. We're seeing, you know, lawyers not taking their vacation time, worrying about taking time off, that their career is going to be, um, you know, they're going to have trouble at work. Um, if I take a leave of time to deal with some of the issues that I'm facing, either mental health or substance use issues, um, it might impact my career. The kinds of things that people are, are seeing, they're not sleeping. They feel an, an incredible pressure because of the billable hour. Um, they're, they can't disconnect. This being on 24-7, 365 is having a really deleterious effect on their well-being. Two other recent studies that I will stress or that I will bring to your attention, one done in, I think it was 2021, called Stress, Drink, Leave. It really was talking about the gender disparity that we are seeing in the profession right now, where one in four women is actually thinking about leaving the profession altogether because of these concerns, because of the mental health concerns. 
Um, we see some, you know, leaving the profession from men as well. But with women, there is a greater disparity. The other survey, um, it was called Stressed, Lonely, and Overcommitted. It was a survey of um, lawyers in the District of Columbia, as well as New York, about 2,000 of them. And it was focused on um, um, suicide, quite frankly. And that lawyers, you know, are two times more likely as the general population to contemplate suicide. And unfortunately, one of the main fa factors in this or focus in this study was male lawyers, right? A notable difference there, the highest risk, a lonely or socially isolated male with a high level of unmanageable stress and overly committed to their work who may have a history of mental health problems being at the at the highest risk. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video and if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more law practice and legal marketing videos. See you in our next clip. Thank <laughs> you.